All right, we're looking south down Electric Avenue. You see the River District sign there on the left. Let's go across the street, uh, which would actually be behind or in front of, depending on how you look at it. Let's just say adjacent to Fort Erin Building Supply, which is this parking lot that you see here. A lot of excitement took place at this location. A lot of shouting and screaming and hollering. And a lot of good times was had at this location as well. That's because there used to be a baseball field here. A field where not only amateur baseball teams played, but also professional baseball teams played as well. This field was named after Bill Watkins. Watkins was prominent in the baseball circles of his time. Bill Watkins spent more than 30 years as a player, manager, front office executive, and owner of various major and high minor league teams. His playing career short-circuited by a near-fatal beating in 1884. Watkins thereafter assumed the manager's post for the Detroit Wolverines, and within three years transformed that National League doormat into the Baseball World Champions of 1887. During his heyday, however, Watkins was most often associated with Indianapolis serving no fewer than eight baseball organizations established in the Indiana capital, finally leaving the diamond scene in the early 1920s. After retiring from baseball, Watkins lived in Port Huron and worked as an executive at banks and land development and manufacturing companies. He also served as president of the Port Huron Chamber of Commerce and helped found the city of Marysville, serving as the first village president and chairing the committee that incorporated Marysville into a city. He was elected Justice of the Peace in Marysville in 1933. Watkins died from diabetes in 1937 at the age of 79 in Port Huron. This is a rare photograph of Watkins Field, and as you can see, it looks like they're going through the process of building the stands, and they had a very nice stands for the customers. You can see by this picture, it was quite large. Uh, it looked like it was built into maybe three sections, kind of a, a half circle to, behind the uh, plate. Um, and of course they had the roofs on there for shade and uh, the elements to keep off the customers. I don't have a photograph of the completed structure, but we do have uh, this photograph here, which if you look in the background, uh, you can see the unique lattice work that uh, these stands had, and so you can identify them quite easily. This was taken uh, in the 1940s, I believe, during a policeman fireman's day. This team photo of uh, the Bowman AC team was taken at Watkins Field. And we'll kind of zoom in on it here. And then uh, we'll go down below here. Some of you may recognize the names uh, by chance. I told you that professional teams also played here. And uh, yes, of course, according to this paper here, uh, Fort Huron did have professional teams, the last one being in 1926. And then you can see in this picture here, this is the last uh, uh, minor league team that played at Port Huron, and the name of that team was the Saints. The Port Huron Saints, to be exact. And here we see a picture on the cover of this booklet by James Mayward that uh, gives some of the facts and descriptions of that particular team that year. I don't want to turn this uh, video into a baseball video, but I did want to share a couple other things with you concerning uh, baseball and portraiture. And then the first one uh, was this fellow right here. Harry Richards played for the 1926 uh, Portrait and Saints, and he was uh, inducted into the Portrait and uh, Hall of Fame and had a nice article written, as you can see here. And to look at that, you would have thought, oh, it must have been an awful good uh, pro ball player. Well, according to this article, he only played three games. It was actually his achievement in sports while he was still in school that he was inducted into the Hall of Fame. In Washington Junior High School, Richards was a member of the state championship uh, football team, which blanked Battle Creek Junior High 28-0 in 1922. It was in baseball, however, that Richards would make his greatest mark. He was a third baseman uh, for Porcher in high school in 22 to 26. As one of the best players in the area, Richards was selected to a thumb all-star team 
and despite being just 15 years old, had the honor of playing against the Detroit Tigers in an exhibition game at Watkins Field in 1923. Of course, Richards couldn't play uh, for the Saints until he finished high school. And in this article, it says this, After my last high school game, I just changed uniforms and played for the Saints the same day. He started at third in the second game of a doubleheader. He didn't make much of an impression with the bat in his short-lived pro career. I got a big kick out of playing with him, but it was hard to make a transition from high school pitching. The pros worked the inside and outside of the plate. The pitching was excellent. The Michigan-Ontario League was a pretty fast league. Charlie Geringer came out of that league. Can you believe that? Said he talked to his dad and brother. He said, my dad, brother, and I talked about it. I decided to skip professional baseball and play for pleasure. If I had been in the minors for 10 years or so, what would I have when I got out? No job and no education. He probably made the right choice. We're looking at the 1926 uh, standings for the Ontario Michigan League. And you can see the Fort Huron Saints did very well. Baseball was very popular in the early days, uh, in the later days, when I say later, I'm thinking like the 40s and 50s on up. Softball uh, took its place and softball became very big. But let's look at some of the baseball teams uh, in the past and what their names were. This, this uh, document here describes it. I'll let you look at it as your leisure. I'll scroll down it, but I'll give you a couple of the highlights on it. First team that we have a record of is back in 1890. It was called the Port Sharon Baseball Club, and that was part of the Michigan State Conference. Uh, the next one in 1895 were called the Marines, because Port Sharon was basically a maritime port. The next one was in the 1900s. It was called the Tunnel Lights. Uh, because of the St. Clair Tunnel. Andrew Patsy Hagerty uh, was the manager and the newspaper called the players Flagerty's Tunnel Lights. The Independents were the next ones, 1912-1913. And this was uh, basically because Port Sharon finally won its independence in 1815 uh, after 130 years of colonial rule. So they were going to be called the Independents. And then, of course, there's the Saints that we've been looking at here uh, right along. And this was you know, basically because they were located in St. Clair County. And so they were called the Saints. Kind of hard for folks today to imagine this, but baseball teams back then hardly ever played on a Sunday. Sunday was a day of worship, a day of going to church, a day of rest. And the city had uh, some ordinances regarding that. And so those one time, according to this newspaper article, they were going to play on a Sunday, and you can see what happens in this article. It says this. A baseball game announced to be played at Fort Charon yesterday afternoon between the Fort Charon and Hamilton teams were caught off. Mayor Moore put his foot down on Sunday ball playing in Fort Charon and instructed the chief of police to arrest every man who attempted to play ball he could have notified the manager of the Port Sharon ball team that the mayor's orders would be carried out and accordingly the game was called off. We certainly live in a different time. Baseball was pretty popular in high school as well. Port Sharon high school ball uh, baseball started at Port Sharon High around 1900 with scrub games and vacant lots. The first organized baseball games were played at southwest corner of Griswold and 7th Street, about 1912 to 1920. In 1920, the teams moved to Watkins Field in South Park, the same field that the Saints played on along with many other semi-pro teams. As far as the younger boys playing ball, well, of course, they didn't have a Little League back in those days, but they still have competitive uh, conferences, and as you can see in this photograph here, the team from South Park came out a winner. This picture here was taken in the early 30s, and it shows the uh, South Park baseball team. They just won the city championship in their age group. And this uh, photograph was taken in Pine Grove Park. Now scroll down here, you may recognize some of the names. On this map here, where 24th and Electric intersect, you can see Porcher and Building Supplies. And if you look just above that, which would be to the north of uh, the building supply, 
you see where it says Port Sharon School's Athletic Field. And that's where, of course, Watkins Field used to be as well. Since Watkins Field was considered Port Sharon's uh, high school athletic field, I imagine the football team played there as well. And uh, here we have a couple of photographs of the football team. The first one uh, that we looked at was uh, the team from 1926. And uh, this one here we're looking at, uh, they look like they're just scrimmaging or perhaps playing even. I can't tell. The picture isn't real good, but it is a piece of our history. All right, that's enough sports. Uh, let me see if I can find something for you folks that are interested in sports. Uh, looking at this aerial uh, shot again, uh, remember we looked at it before when we were looking at uh, the River District uh, grocery store there in the center. But in this red rectangle here, uh, you'll see another building. And today that building looks like this. It's the Moose Lodge, uh, or Moose Family Center, as the sign says here. But before this, it was the Edgewater Inn. A pretty nice looking building, really. And you can see that not only an inn, but also a restaurant, because in the signage above, you can see where it says chicken, fish, frog, and steak. Quite a little assortment there. Here's another view of it. This is the rear, which would have been facing the river. And you can see the second floor it had uh, balconies all the way across for the, the guests that were staying on the second floor. So they had a nice view of the river. This picture is taken inside the inn and I imagine they would have had this room for you know, group meetings of uh, any sort that they might request. The building we've been looking at is the one in the rectangle but just to the right of that there's another building there. Uh, a hotel it used to be uh, the Riverview Hotel. And later on, it became the Reef Restaurant at that location. In this map here of 1940, you can see the uh, Riverview Hotel uh, designated quite well on this map. I'm not sure what happened to the hotel, whether it was torn down uh, in order to make the restaurant or if it was torn down before that. Regardless, uh, today the area looks like this because neither one of those buildings are there anymore. Many folks remember the Reef Restaurant. It was a, a nice place to take your date or your wife or even the family. A little better than average restaurant and the fare was better than average too, as you can see from this menu here. Just look at the selection on this menu. Boy, it makes you hungry just looking at it. Boy, those prices are great too, although back then that was quite a bit of money, but today it would be quite a buy. And look at this. Pick a live lobster from our lobster tank. You can't get any fresher than that. Something else about the restaurant that was unique is that you could drive up in your car to the restaurant hour. You could drive up in uh, with your boat to the restaurant. Either way, they had docking facilities in, in the rear of the restaurant. So if you had a nice day out of the boat, wanted to have a good meal, just dock it and come on up. Reef Restaurant became another sad story in Port Sharon. It was uh, destroyed by fire in 1985. We have some wonderful pictures uh, taken by Charles Weisler. I hope I'm pronouncing that name correctly. If not, my apologies. Uh, his son, John, has a website with many, many pictures on it, different uh, fires in the Port Sharon area. So it's certainly worth your while to look at this site, as you can see right here. And if he finds something to interest you, he also has some for purchase. John has graciously given me permission to use uh, his photographs uh, that his dad took in this video series, uh, which I'm much appreciative because they're wonderful pictures. The first photograph that we see here is the entrance uh, to the Reef restaurant. Welcome aboard, it says. Please disregard the fire. Here you can see the fire in full swing, an awful lot of smoke. Here you can see the Coast Guard was fighting this from the riverside as well. Uh, not only from the, the boat there, but also uh, on the docks. They had a couple of fellows up there with hoses. And here it looks like they have it pretty well under control. 
Here they're going through the building and just the day before people were sitting right here having a good time. You can see here it was very heavily damaged. And once more, poor Jen has lost another business with the disaster of a fire. In our next video, we'll look at three men who had a vision, and that vision was South Park. I think you'll find it very interesting.